Well, thank you, Ken. Uh, we all know that getting started in ranching is no small feat. And today we're going to share some of the frustrations and challenges that we have overcome and some of the tools, ideas, and practices that have gotten us to where we are today. We just wanted to start out the um, presentation by saying some of the challenges we've seen as beginning ranchers is that as we looked around, there was a lot of degraded soils. And this is a picture of the um, when we first started on a place that we're on right now. And as you can see, uh, we didn't start out with anything special. And so we knew that we had to start out to and uh, try and rebuild our resource from the beginning. This is a picture of some trailing and erosion that uh, we've been told by the neighbors started in the 1930s. And it just leads us to realize that management of the past still can affect us today. Another uh, challenge that we saw as a beginning rancher is some of the very high financial risk of startup in ranching. Usually when you're young and starting up, you don't necessarily have a very large amount of capital. Um, we didn't have, uh, slide. we had very little capital. Um, under a conventional scenario, you're usually going to have very poor yearly cash flow due, due to only selling calves once a year. Uh, we were looking at potentially getting into a huge amount of debt with cattle and equipment purchases. And on top of all this, the land just wasn't producing enough to cover those um, inputs with the price that we were being asked to be paid for our rent. This is kind of the scenario that we were looking at as getting started. Uh, we were going to be looking at maxing out our FSA loans on just cattle and equipment purchases. And when we sat down uh, with a financial advisor and looked at our cash flow analysis, in year one we were showing a negative $38,000. And this was with Krista's off the ranch income being figured into this. And on top of that on paper we were showing a net worth increase of only $9,000. And with this being on paper, it really didn't make any difference to us because we wouldn't be able to pay off the loans that we had. And this was just a scenario that was way too risky and it wasn't something we wanted to get into. So Jay and I had pretty much hit a wall. We um, both have a desire to ranch full time. Hopefully someday I can come back to ranch also. And we really want to run a profitable ranch with financial freedom. When you hit that wall of not knowing what to do next financially, you figure out a different way to go about it. And we also don't want to continue to degrade the resource, we want to improve the land. So to really make a long story short, we were in the right place at the right time, we were blessed to meet the right people, and um, this kind of led us into how we ranch now. And what we did right away was, you know, the cattle and calves, they just required too much labor versus uh, working off the ranch. Like Jay said, we weren't going to have enough money, and our poor rangeland that was overvalued, it just wasn't producing enough to get us started. And we don't want to go through this entire presentation having to wonder what our unfair advantage is. Um, really at this point, we feel our unfair advantage is our mindset because we're willing to step outside the box and we're not concerned with society's pressures. By the end of this presentation, you might think we're crazy, but we're okay with that because we'd rather be crazy and profitable than <laughs> but um, we also have a willingness to learn and change. We know we don't know everything and we always want to continue learning. And you have to be, as young ranchers, we have to be satisfied with our quality of life now to have a better quality of life later. And a big advantage to us is we have very supportive family, neighbors, and friends cheering us on, wanting to see us succeed, and many of you guys are here today, and we greatly appreciate your support. Um, in our situation, these are just some of the tools that we use that we're going to cover today. We're just going to kind of be all over the place, but this is what really works good for us. Um, to dive right into the financial management, Jay and I, we sit down and we plan a yearly budget, we do a monthly budget, and we're um, tracking everything. Every dollar we track where it goes. And we want to do this to minimize debt because debt will only um, increase our chance of risk and our chance or increase our chance of failure. And it's just too risky for us. And also staying away from debt, we can make our own management decisions. We don't have to have a loan officer looking over our 
our shoulders. Also, with our planning, we plan profit, so we're telling our money where to go, not wondering where it went at the end of the year. And with planning profit, we can figure out what items we want to invest in, and we want to invest in profit generating items. So our resource right away, we had really poor water distribution across our pasture. So the first thing we purchased was a water system that we can move around. Then we, all, we have no cross fencing where we live, and so we purchased fencing materials. And then we started um, purchasing cattle to help, you know, we want to have a ranch, so we want cattle. <laughs> um, also, we don't invest much in depreciating items like pickups and tractors. We have them. They're just bare bones. They're nothing fancy. I mean, we'd like to have something nice, but that really ties into controlling our, our financial behavior. We have a long-term goal, and we know having fancy things isn't going to get us to our goal. So we really um, uh, look at our needs versus our wants. <laughs> and we also have, for our financial management, uh, less equals more mentality. Um, running fewer herds actually saves us time, and we have better management of all acres. So the fewer herds we can run, the better. Um, with farming and ranching, you often hear you have to farm so many acres, run so many head of cattle to be profitable, but that's not necessarily true for us. And also, you know, is renting more land profitable? We've turned down land because it isn't producing enough um, for the prices being asked, or it might be good land and it's too far away from home, or um, if we have to haul our cattle there or we can't get get there in the right amount of time to do good management on the land, uh, we will turn down the land. Also, we have uh, less machinery because that reduces our risk, so we'll have a smaller repair bill. A uh, different thing that we do is we have leased cows. We don't do share cows because they're too risky. With the leased cow, we um, know what our cost is right up front. We take care of her like she's ours. We feed her and take care of her health, and at the end of the year, that calf um, is ours, and we can put it back into our herd to build our herd debt-free, or um, we can sell the calf. And then we also work in custom raising cattle, and this really helps us out with cash flow, because as beginning ranchers, just having one check a year with the calf check uh, made us, would make us go into a lot of debt. But by doing this custom grazing, we're able to get cash flow at, uh, multiple times during the year. Also, um, we can use any excess grass we have. We can run them through the custom grazing cattle. If we have a drought, our custom grazing cattle, we can just uh, plan on not bringing them the following year if it's getting dry or reduce the numbers. And really with our custom grazing, we're just um, using them to also uh, let us build our herd debt free and just keep reducing the numbers every year. Um, the time management as a beginning rancher is really important. A lot of ranchers uh, don't put a, a value on their time, and time is a very precious commodity. So we make sure that our ranch is returning to us equal to or more than working a job off the ranch. Um, so it's just really important that we manage our time and look at all our practices that we're doing to make sure they're returning to us. And another thing we do is we try to set up our cows so they can work more for us and um, just set them up for success. As we get into the expectations that we have for our cow herd is we're looking for just an average cow. We aren't aiming for the extremes that uh, some, of the, some other individuals might be looking for. We found that in our land base and under our management, a moderately sized cow is gonna work best for us. We expect her to be easy fleshing on our grass and under our management, breed back yearly, uh, we rotationally graze while we calve, so we expect her to calve unassisted out on pasture, have a good udder, and uh, it, we expect her to be healthy. And we're trying to get our cow herd to a more parasite-resistant cow herd as well. And with our replacement heifers, we expect the same out of them, but we try and go by the philosophy of we want that replacement heifer to be conceived, born, grown, and bred on our grass, on our forage, and on our management. Uh, a couple of the things we do uh, with our replacement heifers is we uh, graze them and run them with the cow herd. We allow them to stay together in family units. Um, it's kind of interesting to watch over multiple generations. You will see a mama cow with her uh, replacement heifer and also her brand new calf grazing together. 
And also this helps us decrease labor because we're running one herd instead of running a cow herd and running a separate replacement herd. It just, it helps us from a time management standpoint. Uh, when we got started, we knew we were gonna have to pay attention to our cow size. And like I said, we found that a more moderate frame cow will do better for us than a, than a large frame cow will. And so we're effectively able to graze more cows and sell more pounds of uh, calf per acre, even though we are having a smaller size calf. We've moved our calving season uh, to a little bit later spring calving. Uh, our goal with our calving season is approximately May 8th through July 1st. We really enjoy this because the nutritional needs of the cow are met by the forage resources of our land, which helps us save money overall. Our cows are in better body condition score and better physical shape when they do calf uh, because they're out walking around and are able to take advantage of that lush spring grass. We have a huge reduction in the required labor. Like I said, we expect our cows to calf unassisted, uh, but we do use a lower birth weight bull because we need to give that cow the advantage, uh, the advantage to help her along with that. But there are times when uh, things don't go as planned, so we have invested in a portable calving pen because there are emergencies that come about at times. The, some of the other benefits of spring calving is we aren't uh, dragging calves through the mud and we aren't dealing with cold weather. We really don't have any sick calves at birth. Uh, we have no predator problems and we're also able to save money because we aren't having to have uh, large calving facilities that uh, usually end up draining, draining your cash flow. Uh, we're able to get more sleep. We check, cab, we check our cows twice a day during calving. I go out in the morning and check, and then in the evening when Krista gets home from work, we go out and check together because who doesn't want to go out and see some new baby calves after they get done with the day of work? So, and uh, we're also able to sell more live calves at the end of the year, because even though they are smaller, um, because we do have a higher percentage of live calves for them. Uh, we're, our breed back on our cows is better, which ties back to the nutritional requirements being met by the forages. Uh, but the one thing we have found is that if you're rotationally grazing while you're calving, it does require a little bit of extra planning. Uh, when you're moving baby calves, there, it's just one other thing you gotta, you gotta pay attention to and just plan for, and it all works out. Like Jay was saying, um, we have to take a little extra time to do our planning. And as young ranchers, that is very important. Just like planning your uh, financials, planning the grazing system is huge for us. And we spend a lot of time on this. We um, use maps and these online measuring tools, which are really helpful because you can determine the acres. And we do everything in cow days per acre because our cows are on the land for such a short amount of time. And I'll talk a little bit more about our cow days per acre. But, you know, everybody's like, well, why do you even make a plan? Because it always has to change. And, you know, we have like 250 acres underwater one year, and we always have stuff getting thrown into our grazing that just doesn't work. And um, so we have to be able to adapt and change, but as long as we have a long-term goal in mind, we know where we want to put those cows. And then when we're doing our grazing system, um, we focus on the best location and not the worst because our ecological and financial returns will be greater and quicker. I think it's uh, human nature really to get caught up on the worst area and focus uh, all your time and money on that when you could be making improvements on your better areas and it'll just return so much quicker. Um, our grazing system is really about getting the cows to the right place at the right time for the right reasons. And we do this on a big scale and on a small scale, so we sit down and we know um, how we need to feed our soil in the different parts of the pasture. But when we're out there building our individual cells, we'll move a fence a few feet to get a different trample, or um, we pay a lot of attention to what we're doing when we're out there building those fences. And some of the things we do is an intense rotational graze with daily moves, and we also move every three to six days. We have our mob grazing treatment where we move them up to four times a day depending on the production. We do winter grazing, which we'll talk about more later, and we have our quality of life grazing or vacation grazing. And if we know we wanna go on a vacation sometime, we just plan that into our grazing system. Or if like something comes up, we know where we wanna put our cows to have that type of grazing if they're gonna be in a cell a little longer. And rest, I put that on here because that has been huge for us as beginning ranchers. I think it's one of the tools that is least used and it has huge returns. And I'll just show you kind of 
some returns that Russ has had for us. This is what we started out with, and then one year later, we just let it rest, and we had a bunch of production that we were able to come in and graze. This is nothing but rocks and cow pies, and just with a little rest, we got sweet clover and Kentucky bluegrass, but at least the ground is covered. Um, even rest on a smaller scale is really important to us. On the right side of the screen here, I don't know if you can quite tell, but the, it's a little bit greener. And on the left side, we had just moved the cattle off. And even rest on a small scale, even if it's a couple days, it's really important to us because we want those plants to recover and start building reserves. Um, the pasture we were running on was continuously grazed when we started. And in, this is what it looked like in 2010. You can see the creek bank here. There's no vegetation in our saline soils that we have. And this is looking the opposite direction in 2011, and you can see the creek bank is starting to revegetate and stabilize. This is an aerial view from 2010, and you can see there that um, the banks have no grass covering them. We have a lot of bare ground and a lot of trailing. And if you watch closely, after we rested it and a couple of years, we uh, have the banks starting to stabilize. The grass patches are starting to expand and fill in that bare ground, and the trails are healing. And this makes us really excited because saline soil is really hard to get stuff to grow. And this is our worst area on the ranch. And we, you know, if this is improving this much, we're really hopeful, you know, that our uplands are improving a lot also. And we really, you know, as beginning ranchers, we're trying to improve the rangeland. We want healthy plants that are nutrient dense for our cattle, so they have also um, deeper roots, so they're more drought resistant. We want to improve the water cycle on our ranch, so um, we can keep the water on the landscape and make it available for the plants to use. Feeding the soil biology is really big. We plan that into our system if we're going to give them a high carbon or a low carbon, like what we're going to trample. We want to keep the ground covered to feed that soil biology and retain moisture. And we're hoping sometime we'll see an increase in production that hasn't happened yet, but we know this is a long-term deal. And we are trying to build a drought resistance into our pasture. These are a couple of the tools that we use out on the ground as far as our um, fencing goes. Uh, like Krista said, we don't have any um, cross fences in our pasture, so everything that we do is with temporary electric fence. And a couple of the uh, tools just on there is on the back of the four-wheeler, there's some rollers and they have a poly braid on them. And this is just a easy to use electric fence. It's easy to take, put up and take down. We also use a couple different types of step-in poles. <laughs> And once again, we like to use these just from the portability standpoint and the ease of use. We also uh, like to use our bat latches, especially when we're mop grazing. And this is just a closer view of what a bat latch is. It's uh, nothing more than a solar powered automatic gate opener. And you set the time on the bat latch itself that you want the, the gate to open and a finger will move to allow that spring gate to open up and the cows virtually move themselves. And uh, we really like to use this during our mob grazing because we do move up to four times a day, but I only have to go out there once in the morning to set up for the entire day. And this is just a couple pictures of the mob going through into a new cell. And in this last picture, uh, when we moved, when we let them into this cell, the first thing that the cows took after were what we would call weeds. And uh, we weren't quite sure what was going on, but we started doing a little more research and found that these so-called weeds that some people call undesirable were very nutritious and very nutrient dense. And it just brings us to the conclusion that sometimes we need to observe and let the cow tell us what she needs rather than us thinking we know what's best for her. This is a before picture, um, before we started mom grazing. And after the cows left the cell, this is what it looked like. We have the plant material um, in contact with the soil to feed the soil biology. We're trying to retain moisture and make a good seed bed for seedlings. Um, this is just a zoomed out view of what the mob grazing looks like on a highly productive area. But on a lower productive area, it uh, looks a lot different. Uh, this is a trample on a thin hillside, and we're just trying to get the manure and urine evenly distributed across the land and 
get that plant material in contact with the soil to feed our soil biology. Um, so Kentucky bluegrass after the mob, I just wanted to show that, you know, with mob grazing, we aren't taking everything. There's a big misconception that you go in there and you take everything. And you can see here, we just let the cows take the very best. We're, our goal is to trample the material and get it in contact with the soil and feed the soil. Um, here's a different picture of trampling in Kentucky bluegrass. Um, it got trampled a little bit better. But, you know, a lot of people don't find Kentucky bluegrass desirable. And as beginning ranchers, we're not trying to get rid of anything. We're just trying to set the system up um, by feeding the soil and waiting for that diversity to come into our grazing or into our rainforest. One change we have seen in diversity is we had an area that was 100% blue grama and we mob grazed across it and we came back that fall and we had new western wheatgrass growing and this got us really excited. Um, the western wheatgrass, I don't know if it's from the mob grazing and the hoof action or um, if the mob grazing allowed enough rest in our entire system the, and the western wheatgrass was finally able to express itself. Either way, we're just happy because we're adding diversity to our rangeland and strengthening it. For young ranchers, it is extremely important to know your production. Um, we have been training our eyes to determine, you know, how long the cows can be left in the cell, and it takes a lot of, um, you, you learn a lot, like, it takes a long time to learn how to train your eyes, and we're still learning, but we're getting down to where we can figure out by the hour how long cattle should be in an area to get the impact we want so we can get the correct trample to graze ratio. Um, we don't want to leave too much behind, but we don't want to take too much either. Also, knowing your production, you know how many days of forage you have before there's a shortage. So if we have a lot of grass, we can go out there and we can just look and say, well, we can keep you know, the custom cattle another two weeks because we can sell that grass and it works and we kind of plan it into our system. If we have a drought coming, we're going to be able to look out there and say, okay, we need to make these changes at this time so um, we protect ourselves from uh, problems with drought. This is a before picture just to show you how much bare ground we had on the ranch. Um, there's nothing but uh, some dandelion and there's a little western wheatgrass in there, crested wheat and Kentucky bluegrass. And like I said, our goal is to feed the soil and get the ground covered. So we wanted to know if we were even going in the right direction with some of our practices. I mean, we thought we were, but you know, you just kind of wanted something to show us, you know, some hard numbers. So what we did was before we started grazing, we took some 10-point frames, and the bare ground was at 18.8%. And when I did these frames, I was looking right at the ground, and we did one mob grazing treatment, and we got our bare ground down to two. So we're moving in the direction that we hope. Our litter went from 33% to 50%, which kind of makes sense because we're trying to trample that grass. But our litter, we're thinking our soil microbes aren't quite working for us yet. Um, so that's why our litter's kind of high. Our grasses went from 35% to 40%. Our forbs stayed the same, but that's our pasture is so bad. I mean, it's just dandelions and curly cup gum weed. So it's going to take a while for the forbs to start coming in. Um, so we just wanted to monitor to see, you know, are we even going in the right direction um, when it comes to some of our grazing practices. And as Kristen talked about uh, our planning, a uh, thing that we focus a lot on is trying to do our figure out our drought planning. And a couple of the things that we'll do if we do see a drought or forage shortage uh, coming. We'll first combine our herds. Uh, this will integrate more rest into our entire system. It also helps us increase our density so we're able to trample more to get our soil surface covered so we aren't uh, losing any moisture to evaporation. Uh, we also set acres aside each year for a drought. This year we set 160 acres aside to be used if we did get into a forage shortage scenario. We did actually use that 160 acres this year, but it wasn't necessarily because of uh, because we didn't uh, plan the rest of our system correctly, we had a quarter of land that we were planning on grazing that uh, at the very last minute we weren't able to use. So it, it can help in multiple scenarios. Uh, but um, the 
Last thing we'll do if we get into a scenario where the drought is bad enough or prolonged for long enough, we will get to a point where we no longer have a custom grazing herd. And to make up that added income, I would take a job off the ranch until the drought does break. Some of the strategies we like to use for our winter feeding is uh, first, we, first and foremost, we like to winter graze on our native rangeland. Uh, we will supplement our cattle if needed. And uh, once a couple of uh, things come into play where we no longer can graze or we used up uh, the allotted amount that we planned on grazing, we will move on to bale grazing. We have found that the hay we use for our bale grazing, it is more, it is more cost effective for us to buy that hay rather than make it. Uh, the startup costs for the equipment are very high for paying and that was one of our reasons for it. Also in our area, we would could be competing against farmland uh, to put up our hay and it just wasn't cost effective. And from a quality of life standpoint, uh, Krista and I would rather spend our time managing grass than hay. We feel that uh, we're probably better at this and it, we enjoy it better. Uh, but we do also plan for a worst case scenario. We do realize we live in central North Dakota and there are years where we get hit with snow early and it doesn't leave till late. So we make sure we have enough hay on hand from uh, November 15th to April 15th, if needed. With our winter grazing, now uh, we leave the heifers with the cows um, to run as one herd. We allow the cows to teach the heifers what to graze, where to graze, and um, how to get out of a, a storm and get out of weather scenarios as they come about. We do continue to rotationally graze our cows through the winter, trying to move them every three to eight days. This helps us so that we're able to limit the amount of supplement they needed. Uh, some of the things that we'll um, use, some of the indicators we'll use to stop winter grazing are if we have a really thick layer of ice on our grass, if we end up getting uh, over a foot of snow that seemed to be kind of the level for our cows, or if we get a real heavy crust on the snow. And all this just ties back to watching the body condition score of the cows. If you watch the cows, they can tell you a lot. And as their body condition score goes down, we will move them on to um, bale grazing. Just like our drought grazing, our winter grazing has to be planned into the grazing system. Here are our cattle in February 2012. They're out grazing stockpiled forage that we had specifically set aside for winter grazing. And since we were able to use this last year, we figured in hay costs we saved ourselves between eight and ten thousand dollars, which is really big when you're getting started. So it it's just a huge advantage to us to be able to do winter grazing when we can. Uh, when you are winter grazing, we get a lot of comments that, oh, I suppose you're winter grazing, you don't want any snow. We ranch, we want moisture. And we have found that our cattle actually look better when there's snow during winter grazing. And I think it's because they're taking in um, more moisture with that dry forage. Our winter grazing is done on land that needs the most rest or high carbon litter. We've seen that um, those plants break down better into smaller pieces and they um, just lay differently on the soil surface when you winter graze. And so we're able to get the soil covered a little bit better with some of our winter grazing. Also, we noticed that the snow melts quicker on stockpile forage, so we have earlier grazing. We'll save stockpile forage to start grazing in April. And we have seen a big improvement in plant diversity. Uh, winter grazing has done a lot for us. This is a picture, I don't know if you can see, there's a little western wheat grass growing and it's growing all the way up the hill. And this was pr previously uh, Kentucky bluegrass and some crested wheat. And we set this aside, or this land aside, just for winter grazing. And in the spring when the snow melted, we had this new western wheat grass coming in all over where it was previously a lot of Kentucky blue and crested wheat. And it, there was more western wheat where the cows walked. Um, so it has something to do with animal impact. We're not exactly sure, but uh, it makes us wonder what we're doing to our native rangeland when we take the cattle off in the winter time. Since the bison were grazing in the winter, I mean, they did migrate, but um, they had impact on the rangeland, and we've seen some good improvement with diversity. When we do get uh, done with our um, native range grazing and move on to bale grazing, we have seen it to be one of the lowest input practices with some of the highest rewards. We're able to reduce our fuel consumption through the winter, reduce wear and tear on equipment. Um, our actual fuel bill 
that we have from winter of 2010 through 2011 was $700 for the entire winter. And for 2011 through 2012, our total fuel bill was $360, but we only allotted half of that to that winter, and then we brought half of that over to this winter because we were able to uh, leave some of the hay out there so we weren't having to set out bales this winter. Also on top of this, we're able to increase our cash flow because during the winter, I'm able to work a job off the ranch to bring in some added income. With our bale grazing, we try to use the philosophy of letting the cows work for us. We've had people tell us, well, there's too much, especially the winter of 2010-11, there's too much snow, how can you bale graze through that? Shouldn't you be taking the bales to the cows? And I look at it from the standpoint of that cow, she has legs, she's mobile. And it is a lot easier for her to break a path through the next set of bales than it is for me to put up with the headache, the extra added costs, and the frustration of trying to blow snow, move snow, to get the hay to the cattle. Um, I just would rather have her work for me so I can go uh, bring in some added income. With our bale grazing, we try and move the cows every five to eight days. This is the same thought process as with our winter grazing. It helps them balance their uh, nutritional needs. And we also are able to keep the cattle out of the corral uh, throughout the winter. Our corral is right alongside a creek. So we want to keep that manure, keep that urine out on the land where it's best used, keep the nutrients there, and without having to haul, haul it out there. Once again, she's mobile, she can take her manure and urine and spread it out there for us rather than us having to pay to have somebody else do it. This was a scenario that I put together two years ago on uh, bale grazing versus conventional feeding costs. At the time, we had about 90 animal units and uh, we were set out 14 weeks of bale grazing and we were planning on moving the bales to it, or moving the cows to a new set of bales once a week. And then I have the costs associated with that for uh, labor and fuel for setup, and then also labor while we were actually moving the cattle to new sets of bales, and it came out to just under $1,400. And this is a scenario I put together for the conventional feeding, where I figured it would take about an hour and a half a day to feed that number of animals, over the 98 days, and then labor associated with that, and fuel associated with that, came out to a total of just under $5,700 for a savings of bale grazing of $4,300. And you got to remember, this is only over 14 weeks. This isn't over the entire winter. And then in that 14 weeks, I was able to work a job off the ranch of about 35 hours a week, returning an extra $8,300. For a total of savings and added income of a little over $12,000. But we extended that over 10, 20, and 30 years, and the numbers become quite substantial. And this, once again, is only 14 weeks and only with 90 animal units. Then we extended it if we were to have a 300 animal unit cow herd and do that over 20 years, we could potentially save almost a half million dollars. And, you got, and this is at today's prices. We don't know what's going to happen over the next 20 years. But uh, that's pretty substantial. And then with bale grazing, you often hear about the waste. Well, if the waste just kind of circles around and it's just more profit, we use bale grazing on our areas that need the most litter. And so we add litter to the soil by grazing. And you can just watch this H brace kind of as a focal point here. And so the cows have just gotten done grazing. And this is in the spring. And you can see there's some grass growing out of the middle and um, the dark areas here are where the bales were. Those are really nutrient-dense plants. Um, we've seen some really good uh, results of bale, from bale grazing for increasing our diversity in our rangeland. We had um, mostly Kentucky bluegrass growing all around the edges of the bale. And then right on the bale edge was western wheatgrass that came in. So we thought that was pretty Interesting. And then we also had uh, western wheatgrass and a vetch growing right out of the middle of the bale. And this bale was nothing but a uh, wormwood and broom. So we found this pretty interesting. We don't really know why it's happening, but we're just happy it is. Um, here's another scenario. There's a bale that was right here, and then there was another bale down in this corner. And in the winter, the cows walked in between the two bales, but they never touched the ground. But when that snow melted um, that spring, 
this area turn into more western wheatgrass, and you can see the tall Kentucky bluegrass on either side, but um, we had western wheatgrass coming in just from the cows walking on top of the snow. So I really can't explain that either. Um, we have really healthy grown grass. The cows don't care if it's a native plant or introduced, they'll, they'll eat it. So um, this grown grass in our bale grazing had leaves that were H Y. We also saw, um, this was in a different year, we saw western wheatgrass appearing in a stand of crested wheatgrass. So our rangeland was really invaded with crested wheat. And this is all crested wheat in the background, and you can see the bale was like right here, and this is the edge, outside edge of the bale. And this is all western wheatgrass coming in, and actually went all the way back into here. And we just are very happy to be adding, you know, diversity to our rangeland. And we take a lot of time to observe. We actually should take more time, but by observing, we've seen that some changes have occurred really quickly for us, while others have been more slow. Resting our rangeland and doing winter grazing has been huge for us as beginning ranchers. And it's just so important as a young rancher to take time to observe. Otherwise, you have no idea if you're moving in the right direction. And as you take time to observe, the practices that uh, make the most impact will quickly become obvious. But if we wouldn't have taken the time to learn, uh, we wouldn't have ever been exposed to some of these ideas. And now that we have this knowledge, we're able to have life without <coughs> getting up to check cows and heifers in the winter time because we're calving out of sync with nature. We get to have life without dragging calves through the ice and the mud. We get to have life without chores every morning and the large winter fuel bill that goes along with it. We get to have life without battling a baler on a 100 degree day. And we get to have life without a nagging loan and a loan officer that's uh, looking over our shoulder and second guessing what we're doing. And also with this knowledge, we're able to have life, or life with livestock that work for us. We get, to have, we get to plan profit into our year and have the financial freedom that goes along with this. And we're also able to have time to have a life. Granted, this is probably the one that Krista and I need to work the most on, but we do have the time to do things for ourselves if we desire to take it. The future of ranching, as young ranchers, we kind of get, we get asked this question quite often, and it's a big question. And everybody's um, financial situation starting out is really different, but we all depend on the same resource. And we really need to make some changes because future generations are not going to have a very good chance of making a go at ranching because the land is so degraded. Um, we, everywhere we look, we just see a constant state of harvesting that grass and only focusing on the current year's profit. I think there's a lot of ranchers that are like, can we get through this year? We'll just make it through this year and then next year we'll change. And they get stuck in this cycle where they're just saying we'll change next year. And really we need to change now because we're not passing on, you know, anything, but we're just passing on cow pies and rocks for the future generations to work with. And we really need to be building up biological wealth to pass on to the future. Um, as far as the future for us, we have some different things um, that we're trying. Our calves have been running on the cow all winter, and we're going to be weaning them in April. And then once we're done calving, pretty much the middle of June, we're going to try putting our grass caps and our pairs together. And we're going to try to reduce our labor by having our grass caps and pairs running in one herd. And we're going to continue to use all different types of grazing. Just because we use, you know, mob grazing now or winter grazing, um, we're going to stay flexible and open-minded and do what the land um, is asking for um, and what it requires. We would also like to do some multiple species grazing. We'd really like to get some sheep or goats. Um, we just don't know when that time is right, if we're gonna, or when to get them, because we feel we can stack enterprises, we can feed the soil better with that uh, additional livestock and hopefully bring in a little more income. Also, we would like to, um, you know, if it's right, expand our business, if we have the right opportunities, whether it's livestock or land. We want to continue removing crutches from our cow herd so they can work harder for us. And most of all, um, we want to have fun. Because if we're not enjoying what we're doing, we better just go find a different career. We realize that the last couple years have been really good for agriculture. 
<laughs> we believe that in our lifetime there's going to be some huge reality checks. And we just want to make sure that our ranch is prepared for these, both financially and biologically. And I know we covered everything rather quickly today, so if you have any questions or want us to go into more detail, please feel free to contact us. We'd be more than happy to help out and I don't know if we have time for questions or not. I guess we have no minutes. <laughs> I liked your comment about the uh, uh, poor part of the grass because you'll often find that about your cowbird. You'll always have that poor cow in the corner standing looking at you. So, you know, you want to get rid of that and not even worry about it. So, I, I really like that comment about uh, looking after your good grass first and your other grass will fall. Thanks. <coughs> how we deal with our water supply when we're bale grazing. Uh, we actually uh, plan our bale grazing on areas that are usually within about a half mile of our yard. And we have a, a free flowing well that uh, we fill a water tank with and we just expect the cows to walk back and forth for that. Uh, we haven't quite gotten to the point of having them just live off the snow when we're bale grazing yet. Also, our more degraded areas are closer to the water, the water tank because the cows over when it was continuously grazed, they were there the most often, so that's where we have the least amount of litter too, so it works out good. There's another question. Though. What do you see as some of the challenges with one of your grass cattle with your pairs? Well, we're kind of wondering if the calves are gonna start nursing on the cows again, so that'll be the biggest thing. And um, we ran our 30 heifers with the cows this year, and the only ones we had problems with were cows that weren't bred. They just wouldn't kick the calf off, and then once we put them back together, like we separated them for 45 days ago, and um, the cows that were open, they started nursing their calves again. That was our biggest problem. Otherwise, we haven't had any problems running our younger calves or our yearlings with the herd. Also, we're gonna have to watch and make sure we're giving enough forage you know, for both the cow and the yearling. You know, giving them enough to eat so they're not eating too much. Why do you deal with invasive species you guys bale graze to bring that hay in on the pastures? Well, the question was how we deal with invasive species that comes in on the hay that we purchase. And uh, with our bale grazing, we just need to realize that we're going to have to put an increased amount of management on that land the following year. If we do see some uh, undesirable weeds coming in, we will take our cows and run them back across that area uh, when, the, when that so-called weed is vegetative. And the cows will usually go after it pretty, pretty quickly at that time. Well, and so far we've been lucky. We really haven't had any invasive problems. I mean, you'll get a few extra grown plants coming in, but we got grown in other places. Our wormwood has been minimal, so few that it's not even worth us really being concerned. I'd say the weed problem is pretty minimal, and the cows just love, love those weeds. If there are some around the bale, they'll just graze them right down to the ground. Run on all rented land, 
So everything that we do is pre primarily temporary. So um, that if, if something does come about, we can take it with us if we need to. But uh, it also gives us extra flexibility because we're able to, we aren't tied into certain areas of water points. We're able to move that water around to where we see the need for grazing.